So my friend, we're here today. We have a chance to follow up, to have a part two over an episode that, that you and I talked about earlier. And it was this idea of what does it mean when Calvinists talk about the doctrines of grace? And in the earlier episode, you and I were both talking about this idea that it's not always easy to enumerate just what Calvinists mean when they talk about that. And that's frankly troublesome for non-Calvinists who are looking to define Calvinism. They want, what, what is Calvinism? Give me this nice encapsulated specific definition. And somebody like myself will say to them, we believe in the doctrines of grace. And they're like, okay, that's great. What does it mean? And they're thinking, they're thinking something small, something self-contained, something like TULIP, which is, we talked about. That's one of the reasons why people have this itch. And I think it is an itch. People have this itch to make Calvinism equal to TULIP, because otherwise it's way too complicated and unmanageable when they're trying to conceptualize it. And so we had our first episode. We discussed it. One of the, one of the doctrines that's central in this idea of the doctrines of grace is this idea of the imputation of sin. And so we have this threefold transaction. We have, we have the sin of Adam, this original sin described in Romans chapter 5. And that sin is imputed to his posterity. That means credited to the account of his descendants. And so because of that, they are born in sin. And what does that mean? There's two aspects of it. First is that they have a guilty charge before them in the court of God's divine law. And so even if they don't do anything, even if they never live, even if they die as an infant just having been born and lived for only 30 seconds, when clearly they've not, quote-unquote, acted sinfully, they still bear the charge in God's court for Adam's sin. That's one aspect of what we talked about. The second thing was in addition to bearing that guilty charge, their nature, which was originally created by God without sin, in a state of innocence, in a state of wholesomeness and goodness, their nature is now corrupted. It is marred. It disposed towards evil, and that only continually. So we talked about Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 14 or 15, I think. We had things like Paul saying there that Jews and Gentiles alike are under power of sin. And then he quotes an Old Testament saying, there is none righteous. No, not one, not even one. No one seeks after God. And so that's the second way in which this transaction, this the guilt and the misery of the condition of Adam is imputed and transferred onto us, his descendants. Now then, the beautiful thing, of course, is that while Adam's death gave us an inheritance of guilt and misery, the second Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, he gave us an inheritance when he died. And that inheritance was justification before the Father, an imputed righteousness. So just like Adam and what he did was credited to our account in the negative sense, so too what Christ did, we did not do any more than we participated in Adam's sin. Neither of us, Bradster, were in the garden. But yet, when Christ died on that cross, the scriptures say that he was paying our sin debt. And so that's the beauty of this imputed righteousness. This guilty charge has been answered in court, and we are now free from the penalty of the law of God's divine wrath against sin. Not only that, but we're adopted into the family, and our miserable condition is changed. Now, All of that is just to introduce what we said in the last discussion. So if folks want to get into more details on that, we're going to follow up from that today. But I still thought that was important to recap just to get us started. So, brother, let me throw it over to you for some initial thoughts. We want to build on what we talked about. Some thoughts that would come up that I'm pretty familiar and acquainted with have to do with the idea that's not fair when dealing with Adam in regards to the claims that all are under sin, guilty and completely without hope of God in the world. But what I don't hear spoke for enough, what I don't hear spoken for enough is this, Christ and the imputation of Christ. If I'm thinking this sort of thought about the imputation of Adam, that it's just not fair, 
then am I suggesting with the imputation of Christ that he owes me something, that I am getting what I deserve? Because I like to point to the Pharisee and the tax collector that were praying in the temple that day that Jesus made mention of in the Gospels. One man said, thank you, God. I'm not like this guy. I'm, I do good. I'm really something else. And the other guy said, I have no hope without you. I just don't know what to do. This is just something that I don't deserve. I'm so unworthy. And who walked home justified? It wasn't the Pharisee that made the first pronouncement. It was the tax collector. So before we just brush this off as, I don't agree with how these men are representing Adam and the fall in the garden. Ask yourself if you are collecting wages with Christ. And if your theology might look like this to someone else. Therefore, we shouldn't just dismiss based on a presupposition. And we should really get into the meat of what is being provided with this and test it out and really give it a true chance. Let's throw it over to J.C. Barron and get started. Thank you for that laying of the groundwork, friend. I think you, Bradster, I think you hit a home run. We're following up. And so we've been given sort of ground level introduction to the imputation of guilt from Adam and then the imputation of righteousness from Christ. Now, here's, and by the way, I'm drawing from this from a resource on monergism.com by Ernest Riesinger, and it's called, uh, it's called The Fourfold State of Mankind. And this is a resource that talks about how the fourth century and fifth century theologian Augustine put together in a succinct form an understanding of this idea of four different states of humankind or four different natures that, that people have over the course of their lives and their eternal destiny. And while Augustine, here's the beauty, Augustine is a bad word today amongst many, and that is a shock and also a shame. Because if you're going to talk about most important theologians, of course the Holy Spirit speaking in the Scriptures is really where it's all at. But if you're going to talk about learned men moving the ball on theology, advancing our understanding of things through discussions and through writings and through interactions, then a couple of names come to mind. Of course, John Calvin, Martin Luther, definitely even though he's not on quote-unquote our side, the Calvinist side, I think everybody has to acknowledge that Thomas Aquinas in the Middle Ages has got to be in the top five, if not perhaps maybe in the top three of theologians. But on the same point of view, I think anybody's list has to have Augustine, if not in the first spot, certainly in the top three. And people who don't, I think, are really missing something crucial. And so Augustine thought about the nature of grace. He thought about the nature of human sin, uh, what the scriptures were testifying about those. And he came up with this idea of four stages of the Christian's life. Now, he wrote about this in his writing called the Anchoridion, and we're citing a passage from chapter 118. And so remember, we're talking about a Christian here. We're not talking about someone who never comes to faith. That's going to be a slightly different discussion, uh, a shorter discussion, to be frank. But Christians, a spiritual change and transformation comes over us. And that's part of this testimony. It's a spiritual alchemy of a sort. In the Middle Ages and even before, going back into antiquity, everybody in chemistry or alchemy wanted to find a way to turn lead into gold. And no one ever did. No one was able to transmute lead, which was a very common element, into gold, which was a rare element, but much more desirable. And also, frankly, much more useful, aesthetically pleasing element. But so there was a lot of time and energy and effort. What would it take to make something that was lead into gold? And the answer is that the chemists and alchemists of antiquity in the Middle Ages were never able to solve this problem. And one thing of the things that Augustine points out so well is the change that happens when 
we go from, as a human species, when we go from innocent to a state of fallenness and sin, this is something similar in a spiritual sense to gold turning into lead. So the good thing has become a bad thing. And this fall into sin is not a little deal. It's not a minor deal. You'll have people on the other side of the coin from Augustine. And I'm thinking here of Pelagius and other folks who have Gian-style ideas about the human nature. And without meaning to speak for all of them, when you talk about people who make human will this autonomous primary thing, what you realize, one of the implications of what they're saying is that the change, spiritual change in the sinner when they accept God or when they reject him has to be minor. Why? Because the human will could change at any old time, so to speak. He might just decide of his own free will one day to, do, to be in one state, and he might very well decide the next day to be in another state. And I don't mean to be flippant about it, but I think that's at that core. This idea is that man's nature is very mutable, and it's very difficult to distinguish between a good state. And so this differs from the knowledge that Augustine brought about here. And so, in a sense there, changing from states of innocence to guilt in Pelagian schemes are really very superficial. It, it's almost going to your closet and deciding, what clothes am I going to wear today? Am I going to wear my navy blue suit, or am I going to wear my khakis? And it's almost like the human nature is like a pair of clothes that you can put on or you can take them off and put another nature on. And that's really a big deal. And it's quite the opposite of what Augustine is thinking about here. And so we're going to talk, and I'm going to read from this passage from the Incheridion in just a moment. But Bradster, first, I just wanted to pop over to you and ask, have you heard this kind of thing talked about from people who don't see the value in what Augustine has to say? And what were some of your thoughts when you've encountered different views on this? We have a trinity, and that's the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And I'm not saying this mockingly or snarky or weird, but it's not the Father, Son, Holy Me. It's the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So when we take the role of God, that would remind us to the problem that Satan introduced in the garden that really all men, regardless of who they are, fallen or not, they're led by their own desires, and their desires are not perfect. We are not gods. God didn't create a god in the garden. So that's the first thought that really strikes me, especially in the comparison in 1 Corinthians 15 between the first Adam is a living soul like an animal, and the second Adam, Jesus Christ, is a life-giving spirit, God, like the Holy Spirit that points us to this life-giving spirit. He is the down payment for us as believers. Now, what we end up getting from other ideas is pretty simple. They may affirm a version of what they call spiritual death, but it's a byproduct of mortal mortality from the garden in the fall of mankind. So on the day you eat this, you shall surely die. Yes, you're pronounced to die. That's the big deal. And that is the big thing that's being looked at. And then they'll emphasize like what we talked about in our previous exchange on this very topic in Romans 5, verse 12 and 13, that this type of death is physical death, and that spiritual death is not the main thing in mind. It's just a byproduct. And sometimes they even flat out deny it. So when I said a byproduct, that's more like what we would call a semi-Pelagian. Now, a Pelagian would be more like someone who just flat out deny spiritual death altogether. And this is what I come in contact with when I talk to people online, is they would say, we don't care about these terms. We don't care about Augustine. We don't care about Pelagius. This is all just a bunch of Roman Catholicism. This is, none of this should even be heard or mentioned. And we know that this is the type of reaction someone has when they literally have not a single point and not a leg to stand on. Throw it back over to you, J.C. Bear. Thank you, my friend. I know what you mean. I think we're in a difficult spot when people don't want to think about this because in my own humble, private opinion, 
and it's an arguable point, but it's definitely the belief that I hold. This is, to me, the key of what I'm talking about when I talk about the doctrines of grace, is this understanding of this transition. Something that was once high, something golden and beautiful, has been changed from gold into lead. And let me just start into Augustine's Enchiridion. And it says here, when sunk in the darkest depth of ignorance, man lives according to the flesh, undisturbed by any struggle or reason or conscience. This is his fallen state. Afterwards, when through the law has come the knowledge of sin, and the Spirit of God has not yet interposed his aid, man, striving to live according to the law, is thwarted in his effort and falls into conscious sin. And so, being overcome of sin, becomes its slave. And so the effect produced by the knowledge of the commandment is this, that sin works all manner of evil. And Augustine uses the term here concupiscence. And he is involved in the additional guilt of willful transgression. And that is fulfilled, which is written, the law entered that the offense might abound. So now we're talking about this situation, brother, where if you go to a part of the world where the gospel has never been heard, and there are still places on this world where we can say that's the case, even after 2,000 years. If you go to one of those places, there is rarely a mirror that a human will look into that shows the depth of sin and evil that is inside of him. And so when God gave his law to Moses, and it was revealed consciously and verbally written down in tablets of stone that God had a law, what immediately became apparent is that everyone who came in contact with that law became conscious of the fact that they could not keep the law. And so what a terrible situation. And so in some sense, the law is a terrible thing, even though It is right, even though it is just. It is a terrible thing for our case because it shows us to our face that we are the way God says. We are guilty, we are vile, we are evil, we are wicked, we are cosmic traitors to God. And had God not given us this law, we could very well have lived our entire life in this state of misery without even having an understanding that's what we were doing. But here's the thing. The plan of salvation is more. Let me go back to Augustine here. But if God has regard to him, this fallen sinner, and inspires him with faith in God's help, and the Spirit of God begins to work in him, then the mightier power of love strives against the power of the flesh. And though there is still in man's own nature a power that fight for his disease is not completely cured, Yet he lives the life of the just by faith and lives in righteousness so far as he does not yield to evil lust, but conquers it by the love of holiness. So what's happened? Remember that passage from Romans chapter 3, verse 10. There is none righteous. No, not one. Not even one. There is no one who seeks after God. What happens is that nothing happens. If God does not aid that sinner, nothing will change. And he will never turn to God of his quote-unquote own free will. But what happens is that's not enough. God does have regard for people, and God monergistically inspires people. He gives them aid. He changes their hearts and minds. Think of Jeremiah chapter 31, where God describes how it is that he's going to overcome this universal enmity and hatred. He says, I will give them a new heart, will write my covenant, my law in their heart, and they will be my people, and I will be their God. Wow. And so this is beautiful. Let me go back to Augustine. This is the third stage. A man of good hope, he who by steadfast piety advances in this course, shall attain at last peace. The peace which after this life is over shall be perfected in the rest of the spirit and finally in the resurrection of the body. So exciting, brother. So there's Ernest Riesinger writes a summary up here of some concluding statements. And he says this, he says, point one, the children of God 
are actuated, are moved by God's Spirit to do whatever is to be done. Point two, they are drawn by Him out of an unwilling state to be made willing. Point three, since the fall, it is owing only to the grace of God that man draws near to Him. Four, it is only owing to that same grace that God does not withdraw or recede from Him. Five, we know that no good thing which is our own can be found in our will. Six, by this magnitude of the first sin, we lost the freedom of the will to believe in God and live holy lives. Now, finally, seven, therefore, it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, not because we ought not to will and to run, but because God affects both the willing and the running. My brother, such beauty, the doctrines of grace, God, that's what it means to be filled with the Spirit. God's own Spirit lives inside of us, and He initiates the goodness that then flows from His gracious hand out into our own bodies, into our own minds, and then we move and act in this world based on what He has graciously given to us, and then we do things that are good, that are wholesome, that are pleasing, because they are in His Spirit's power. And my brother, that is close to a single point for the doctrines of grace, as I think I can get. What do you think about those kinds of things? The funny thing is we see a woman putting on makeup, or we see the actress and actors on our favorite shows and movies, and how they look so nice and dressed up and beautiful and clean. And no matter how much they put paint over what they are, they can't change the fact that they are dying inside and outside. And without God showing them that the inside has to be cleaned, that it's His work that causes you to work, that it's His drawing that you are not able to accomplish, that you cannot do this in and of yourself. You need God to effectually call you by the Father's decree. But what a blessing it is to know that's attached to the fact that you will be raised up at the final day. And with all this being said, the last thing we're thinking about when we're trying to fix ourselves is someone else, something else, much less God. So what a blessing it is to the church to hear what the truth is about yourself Because often we ask the wrong questions. We ask these questions that point us to a specific set of ideas. It's presupposition. That's what these specific ideas are. And the problem with these ideas is God loves everyone just the same. That God gave man the free will choice to choose. That God isn't particular, individual, individualistic. God, he is not focused God is arbitrary. These ideas are not helpful to what we get from what the Bible reads to us, because then we'd have to exercise a thought like this. God knew in advance that most people would reject him, and he loves them just as much, all the same, and the most loving thing he could do with that foreknowledge is throw it all in motion anyway. That's not what we're saying. We're saying that this is particular that this is individualistic, that this love that he puts on you doesn't fail because it's attached to his holiness, because it's attached to his work, and it's his product. It's not yours. It's not wages that you're collecting, but it's an inheritance given to an adopted son. Let me throw it back over to J.C. Bear to continue our beautiful series on Augustine. So, my friend, I think the doctrines of grace— come out of this idea that human nature can go through these transitions. And we talked about the blank slate or the one nature, perhaps, that friends in Christ on the Pelagian side seem to indicate. Now, it's not completely fair to paint all people on the Pelagian side the same way, and it can be somewhat misleading to speak and call them Pelagian uh, in the sense that, of course, Pelagius was was declared a heretic. And I'm not saying by using this term Pelagian that all of my brothers on the opposite side of the issue 
who believe in some of these uh, Pelagian ideas of human nature. I'm not saying that they are all heretics, just was. We're, we're struggling with language here is all that it is. We've got Augustine on one side, and we're looking for a candidate on the other side. And, and Pelagius is the famous example from antiquity. Maybe somebody else has a better example. But the point is, what are the odds that you or I could change lead into gold? When salvation is described as the power of God, where is the power for my Pelagian brothers? When God is exerting and saving, where is this mighty work happening? And I think that's the open question. In the Augustinian understanding, the state of humankind is so changed by the fall into sin that humankind lacks the power to willfully go back to God. And as a matter of fact, the problem with free will is that it's in bondage. That's what it means to be under sin. In Romans 3.10, Jews and Gentiles alike are under the power of sin. If that text about there is none righteous, no, not one person seeks after God, not even one, that's what it means to be sinful. We are enemies of God in that state. We are God haters. We are not neutral. We are not good. We have a nature, have the nature of cosmic traitors. It's the worst thing. And if you look in Pelagian churches today, and again, that loose, I hear a lot of songs about, oh Lord, I stand before you broken. And I'm not disagreeing with that. But what I hardly ever hear in the Pelagian churches that I hear all the time in Augustinian churches is in the Pelagian church, it's this unending I'm broken, God. Something happened. I'm like, the, I'm like the cup which has fallen and has hit the ground and has been broken into pieces. Would you put me back together? And there's no acknowledgement that the scriptures go way past that in the Pelagian side of Christianity. On the Augustinian side, there's a recognition. Not only are we fallen, not only are we broken, not only are we miserable and unfortunate, but we are the worst evil, wicked things that we know. And the only thing, only just response within God's divine law to our wickedness is the divine penalty, the eternal wrath of God against sin. You find that the doctrines of the final state of the reprobate, that is to say, sinners who never turn to Christ, who never repent, who never apply for the benefits of God in Christ. You'll find that in these Pelagian-style churches, they don't know what to do with the doctrine of hell. They don't know what to do with this idea of humankind's final state. And it doesn't make sense in their theology. And then here in the Augustinian theology, we see not only has God fixed a broken vessel. By the way, first of all, that would be a great and wonderful thing to do. If you and I were like a cup like a piece of china, and we fell to the ground, and we were broken by sin, and God patiently gathered up our pieces and re-puts us back together. That would be a beautiful thing. But it would, it's so misleading, because it takes away, and it does not acknowledge the fact that I am the chief villain in my own story. I am the chief evil, and that what has to happen over and above fixing me, un breaking me. What has to happen over and above for that is for this evil wickedness to be judicially managed in, and disposed of in the right way. And this is what Christ has done. He's cleared our name in the court. If I go before the judge without Christ, the judge says, you're guilty, you have to pay the penalty. There's no wiggle room. But if I go before Christ, go before the judge and with the righteousness of Christ. It's not that I'm not guilty. It's that the penalty has been paid, and the law no longer has a sting. And I think, without trying again, without trying to put all of our friends on the Pelagian side into the heretic column, I think they struggle with how to articulate what's going on in this plan of salvation. Brother, how does it look from your perspective? The underestimating of eternal sin has downplayed the value of eternal consequence. 
when the second path, when the second death says strictly, it does not have power over the believer. It does have power over the non-believer who is brought back up, who is resurrected. This mortal body must put on immortality. The garden and what happened there was eternal in nature. Spiritual and eternal go hand in hand. There is no such thing as a spiritual punishment against God that is not eternal in nature in value. So whenever we have this eternal debt to pay, and we realize we cannot pay this debt, as highlighted in our first video, Romans 5 verse 21, as I gave in one of the analogies. So like in Romans 5 at verse 21, with the grand conclusion here of this particular text, what we have is an eternal impact, and that is both for Adam and all that impute Adam's sin, and both for those who are blessed in Christ. So what we clearly have is there is an eternal sin with an eternal consequence. And what we find is when Augustinianism is denied, we even have lesser forms of theology that come up like annihilationism. And this has been ruled a heresy in the church as well. And this is normally held by those who have a Pelagian view. And I do believe it has everything to do with this particular conversation, because what we end up getting is a watered-down sense of wrath, sense of judgment. Really, did the God of Israel order men and women to be stoned to death as one type of, hey, we'll just let you disappear into vapor as the fulfillment? The second death does not have power over believers because the eternal impact of their sin has been atoned for by the Christ. But when we talk about the second death and who name whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life from the foundation of the world, we are clearly talking about eternal impact as the first death caused spiritual death that was offending a just and holy God that the second death, we are clearly talking about the indignation and the justice of God being fulfilled in this action. But if we deny this, we're with a really selfish view of Adam's sin. When it comes down to it, the view that we're left with of Adam's sin, is it fair that people are punished by God? I don't think it is. Therefore, destroy, perish, and all these other terms that are not being mentioned in this particular Augustinian thought, but they are clearly in denial of this Augustinian thought, are just dismissed as no big deal. Like what J.C. Barra alluded to with the work of the Spirit, it's just common things like he granted you the ability to believe and to suffer for his namesake. I don't know anyone that would find a good free will choice in suffering for anyone's name. Therefore, to understand this is to understand a supernatural belief that is true, but not visible. It is where the invisible things become visible to the heart of the believer. What do you say about this, J.C. Bear? Thank you for that. I think you're following the thread where it needs to go. And I want to contrast this Pelagian understand, this Augustinian understanding of the nature of humankind and the nature of God's grace with someone who I would put on the Pelagian side of things. Again, meaning that in a more generous sense than simply pointing a bony finger of condemnation and laughing contemptuously at this person. We'll call him Pastor X. It wouldn't be too hard to figure out who Pastor X is here, but I'm not going to mention the name simply out of a courtesy. But what we see is on the Pelagian side of the fence, we see that it's not clear that humankinds are all that wicked in the first place or in needing of being died for. What is salvation if the Pelagian view is that the human sinner is already in a state where he can change. The state of grace is such that he already has the nature 
where he can freely choose to change from this sinful state to this non-sinful state. And then we could go further to some of the other typical Pelagian points that that de-emphasize the Augustinian side. So Pastor X, it is said about him, Pastor X says that he chooses to focus more on the goodness of God and on living an obedient life rather than on sin. He says that he tries to teach biblical principles in a simple way, emphasizing the power of love and a positive attitude. Now, here's a quote from Pastor X. Some people preach about hell like you're already going there. And to me, the gospel means good news. I'd rather say God is a God of mercy. So I think the people already know what they're doing is wrong. And I certainly believe in hell. But to me, when I see thousands of people before me, it just doesn't come out of me to say, you guys are terrible and you're going to hell. I'd rather say that God is a God of mercy. And so, my friends, I'm not, that was just a particular clip from Pastor X. I'm not trying to make a judgment on Pastor X's ministry. I'm not fruit inspecting him in the kingdom or not in the kingdom. I'm just pointing out that there is a real reluctance to go there. And if we are committed to the biblical text, if we're committed to the Old and New Testament scriptures, then the thought comes to me, why? If the commitment to the primacy of the scriptures is there, I completely understand for Pastor X to stand in front of an audience of thousands and say, when I see thousands of people before me, it just doesn't come out of me to say, F, you guys are terrible. You're going to hell. I get it. I don't think that it would be easy for me to get up in front of an audience of thousands and make that statement. But that's an incidental statement. Whether it's easy or not, the point is, what is the human condition? And if people cannot hear about this human condition from a minister of the gospel, who can they hear it from? And so I'm not going to say that I've never heard statements about sin, about human wickedness and evil in churches that I would call on the Pelagian side of the fence. But having said that, it's never an emphasis And I'm not sure that it's clear to the people attending those churches that they are evil and wicked sinners apart from Christ, and that there is an eternal divine wrath to face. Again, I'm not pointing the the bony finger. I'm saying that a commitment to the Scriptures puts the proclaimer of the good news into a position where he has to speak about such things. And it is precisely that lack of willingness that Again, without me throwing this person out of the church, out of the faith, out of the whatever, without me saying anything other than speaking generally, I'm not sure that's a statement when he says it doesn't come out of me to say these things, even though I believe them. That's almost an admission that this maybe isn't the right vocation for this gentleman. And I'm not trying to belittle, and I'm not trying to condemn, and I'm not trying to easily dismiss what I'm saying is, Pastor, Pastor, the late Pastor Gary Hendricks of Grace Reformed Baptist Church in Mebane, North Carolina, gave a sermon once that I was honored and fortunate to be able to attend. And he said that preaching is a killing work. And what he meant by it is that a proclaimer of the gospel of God risks every time he gets in that pulpit. And if he is unable to speak about the things that the text clearly requires a professional ambassador to speak about, there's something very concerning in that. And so my heart goes out to Pastor X, and my heart goes out to my Pelagian friends who find it very uncomfortable. Now, the interesting thing to me is I would say that there are probably two sets of folks on the Pelagian side. There's a set of folks who are like Pastor X, who says, I believe the things that the scriptures teach about the depravity of man, the wickedness of people, and the wrath of God in an eternal hell, but I'm not comfortable talking about it. And then I think there's the other half of the Pelagian side of the church that doesn't believe those things to be true. They genuinely think humankind is not all that bad, that people might be basically good, that people are in a state where they can just by exercising their own will, 
look to Jesus not as a sin offering, but as an example, just like you might look to Hercules in the Greek culture, or you might look to Shakespeare as a writer. You draw inspiration in that sense, some of them might say. And I would say that is extremely concerning. And again, without trying to use intentionally caustic assignments, I have to say I have my doubts over whether that wing of Christianity is truly Christian. So Bradster, throwing it over to you, we got intense real quick, but I think we're at that kind of point. How does that strike you and when you think about things, and maybe what are some other sort of like closing thoughts that you have to try to pull it all together into one understandable message? When you have bad theology, what ends up happening is it affects your life. You're affected by the fall. But if you deny the severity of the fall, how much more are you affected by it? You don't even know how to discern the most important truth of the condition that you are in with or without Christ. You're in this world, this fallen world that is falling apart, both physically, emotionally, spiritually, and every other way in between. And I'll tell you something else, friends. If you have someone in your life that is extremely Pelagian with their way of thinking, like, I can choose Christ anytime I want, and I don't know, maybe even the holiness of God comes in check. We don't even assemble. It's, we can have women or men as pastors of our church, leaders of the congregations. We, we can literally call down curses on people. We have power to do this. We're apostles and prophets. You'll notice that the most backward-minded people in your life that are talking about Jesus Christ are usually unwilling to fellowship with people that have sane theology, that have not only Calvinistic theology, but even like a Calvary guy, even somebody like a Dr. Walter Martin, and I say his name in quite a high regard, that is not a Calvinist. And even like a Skip Pisic, I say his name in high regard, and he's not a Calvinist. Even like a Charles Stanley, I say his name in high regard, and he's not a Calvinist. Now, why am I saying all this? You'll notice that the most backward people will stay away from church, and that is a huge indicator. Something is off. Not that I'm set pointing the bony finger like my brother here, J.C. Bear, said, but I'm pointing out the obvious Oh, they have a high view of the law that we have to follow Saturday Sabbath. Or, oh, we have a high view of whatever, a low view, a high view. Let's say they're hyper-Calvinists. They'll say anything. They'll make an excuse for anything and anyone that is like them. But if if nobody is just like them, then they'll completely disassociate with everyone and have this unbalanced approach to life and to reason. And how does this support my Augustinian argument against the Pelagian argument? Because we're not against each other. We're brothers and sisters. What I'm talking about is spiritual death is taught in your scriptures. And just like I said, assembling is taught in your scriptures. A male pastor being the head of your assembly is taught in your scriptures. The Bible has a conservative view of the apostolic sign gifts in its general overflow and message. Everything in the Bible happened to bring forth Christ. And Christ is the main point of the scriptures. Let's focus on what all those teachings disclose for you and for me. Because I'm going to be honest with you, the first time that I read Romans 9 and understood what it meant, it was the hardest thing I've ever read in my life. So I'm no better and I'm no worse than you. But what are we? That's a question that we should ask God. What is love? That's a question that we should ask God. What is holiness? Where does it come from? That's questions we should ask God, His Word. Who is God, Creator? Who is who are we? Creature. Distinction. Look up and do yourself a favor. Divine simplicity and ascetics. And you'll see that these concepts are extremely helpful. And it's simply just asking the question: what does God say about man? And what does God say about himself? And where do gifts come from? And what kind of creatures are we? Let me throw it back over to J.C. Bear for some more thoughts. We live in times when accusation is a cheap currency. And if my friends on the Pelagian side of the house feel misrepresented or feel that I just invited them over for tea to bash them, then let me just ask for your pardon 
in the sense that language is difficult here. We don't always have easy terms that mean the same things for the same people. And even with Pastor X, who I cited, is a very famous person in the evangelical world today. It's not my intention to just have a bash fest or to just punch up. I just want us to talk. I think that we are weak in the church today in our doctrines precisely because we've lost this portion of Augustinianism, this understanding. And when I say Augustinianism, we have to ask what we mean by that. Am I saying that Augustine was at another level and he just gets a free pass and what he says goes and what other people say that's different doesn't? No. The point was that Augustine put into words simple concepts that wrapped complicated things up into a package that we could talk about and deal about. So let's do that, my friends. If I've said something a bit too far and hurt your feelings, I genuinely apologize. That's not the intention. Having said that, can my dear Pelagian friends not see perhaps the danger after listening here? I would, I'm not necessarily asking for mass conversions from Pelagianism to Augustinianism, though of course that would be wonderful. I'm really just asking, hey, my friends, can we talk about this? Do you not see the danger of underemphasis? Do you not see how this could be devastating to the church and probably is? And so I hope that that comes through. Let me, Bradster, close us out with a prayer. Lord God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for your scriptures. Thank you for letting us read Augustine together and talk about him. Lord, you are the giver of gift. And so I just pray, Lord, that you would pour out your spirit upon those who are listening. Let wholesomeness and godliness drive. And Lord, where I and my brother spoke truthfully, we pray for vindication as well as for a godly spread and for places, Lord, where I didn't do well. I pray for mercy and forgiveness. Lord, my brother and I think about Psalm 133 and the unity of the faith when we talk about these important doctrinal and potentially disruptive issues. So Lord God, please sprinkle your mercy and let your spirit come through this and speak through this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Lord.